Grace and peace to you, my friends. I was gone last weekend, and I can't tell you how much I missed you, so it's good to be back in the warmth of the Westminster family. Turning to scripture, James and John are among the first disciples whom Jesus calls. These brothers abandoned their father Zebedee and a family fishing operation to follow Jesus for three years. They're often in the company of Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, and so James and John appear throughout Mark's gospel as a part of Jesus' inner circle. They represent the other often unnamed disciples, and more particularly, they exhibit characteristics common to you and me. We're meeting them in this final sermon in the series of the good news of the Gospel of Mark. And in this story, we hear certainly a lion's roar and the purr of love coming forward. Jesus and his entourage are on the threshold of Jerusalem. And this is when the Gospel writer leans on the power of three to teach. This is the final and most explicit time that Jesus describes his ministry and the meaning of the cross. Before I read, please pray with me. Dear God, call us close. Send your spirit to blow away the distractions and place us alongside these disciples so we hear our Savior's words as if he is just an arm's length away. God, startle us with his truth. Amen. I invite you to listen for God's living word as I read from the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Jesus took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, Look, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came forward and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said, What is it that I can do for you? Appoint us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And they replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and the baptism with which I'm baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right or left hand is not mine to appoint, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to get angry with James and John. So Jesus called them all together and said to them, You know, among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as rulers lord it over them. And the great ones become tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be a servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you know James and John? Oh, really, do you know James and John? Growing up, whenever my family ventured on a road trip, my identical twin brothers bickered and bickered about where they sat in the back seat. Back in the day, we drove a sedan missing the, quote, way back of a family station wagon that was always far more popular. So there were just three seats in the back seat. And are you surprised to know that they claimed the window seats? And I got stuck on the hump. 
As they got older, they fought to displace my mom so the winner could ride shotgun. They complained about, you know, we're getting bigger and we need more room, but we saw through their petty desires. In our family, to sit next to the driver brought you closer to the place of power. Yes, you could control the radio. <laughs> At home, they took bickering to new heights. I vividly recall when we moved into a new house. This one had an eat-in kitchen area, a little eating nook, and the corner was a, a banquet, a, a bench seat, and the center seat was in the middle. And if you got stuck in that middle center seat, which they were always refused, that means you were trapped throughout dinner, not a power position, they always refused. They bickered over bedtime curfew, laundry, clothing, what to wear. Somehow they created power positions of who took their shower first or last and always wanted to claim the best towel bar as mine. To this day, I despise listening to petty squabbles. At the time, I wondered if they fought so much because they were identical twins, and they wanted to be seen as different, and one of them wanted to be seen as better than the other. But I know better now. All families have sibling rivalries. Yes, you're nodding your head. I used to spend a lot of Thanksgivings with another good friend of mine, and she and her brother made it a new war every Thanksgiving because they fought, even into their 60s, over who got to be the first one to hold the gravy boat. <laughs> I'm not kidding. In adolescence, this deep-seated desire to groom a sense of self-worth pushes us to stretch our wings we want to know who we are. We want other people to know who we are. And we strive for a place of hierarchy in the family or wherever we find ourselves. And yes, it's insecurity that pushes us to rise above another as if to say, look at me, look what I can do. I have value and worth I'm better than the others. Now, I don't think my mom had any idea when she named her sons after Zebedee's sons how much my brother's youth would mimic the early life of these disciples. And yes, you can piece it together. My brothers are named James and John. So let's return to the original James and John. The gospel writer that tells us that as all of the disciples approached Jerusalem, they were all amazed and afraid and this is when Jesus seizes on an opportunity to teach and finish the sequence of three. So for the final time, Jesus speaks about his suffering and death, and yet again, the disciples ignore his words and demand greatness on the world's scale. But three times it happens, and so maybe this is a hint to us to just acknowledge how confusing, frightening, and strange Jesus' words were then and for us yet today. The good news of the cross then and now is difficult to understand. Jesus' followers could not conceive of the central mystery to our faith from his three simple statements. And then and even today, his saving grace will never be solved or boiled into just a few words to say, I got it solved, that's what it means. In fact, over the 2,000 years of our faith, writers and theologians speculate but never agree. What we do know is that to say the cross symbolizes our faith become empty words unless we embrace it as a pattern for living. And Jesus' cross demands our attention, both going to the cross, being on the cross, and rising afterwards. The first time Jesus predicts his death, Peter refuses because he's expecting a military victor. The next time Jesus talks of his cross, the disciples ignore him to argue who among them is the greatest. And the final time Jesus repeats and expands the depth of his suffering, 
they still can't conceive of what the will rise again means, and they never even bother to ask. Despite Jesus' prediction of death and rising as the culmination of his messiahship, James and John remain fixated on visible, hierarchical glory in the world's terms. Now, as an aside, I'm going to get a little Bible geeky on you. When Matthew rewrites this story, Matthew shifts the request to sit on the right hand and the left side of glory. He takes that same question, but he puts it in their mother's mouth. He makes the mother be the glory-seeking person. Luke's gospel, when Luke rewrites the story, Luke softens it even further by eliminating any of the names. But Mark is pretty biting. And even though Mark's version offers cold comfort by keeping this demand in the mouths of real people, the rawness rings true because we know this happens. This is a part of human nature. This story invites us to honestly consider if we were along on that road, what would we ask of Jesus? Seriously, what would we ask after following him for three years? And then we need to deeply listen to what our request reveals about us. So let's go back to the story. James and John demand, do what we ask. Their desire to be noticed to satisfy the look-at-me craving incites them to reach for the next most visible seats. And not knowing what rising means, they still believe that Jesus will prevail in a glory that they think matters to the rest of the world at the time. It's an ugly story, but laced Throughout this exchange are Jesus' loving words of grace because he takes the worst that they offer and redirects it into something good. Jesus knows they long for an enduring relationship. They've been with him for three years. They speak honestly. They want love and affection and have shown their capacity for intimacy with him and with all the others and with the strangers they meet along the road. Jesus doesn't criticize James and John for them and their ambition. He doesn't say, it's wrong of you to want greatness. It's, it's evil to strive. Instead, he redirects them. He keeps them close because he wants them to stick around long enough to see and then embody a radically different definition of greatness for themselves. And the story... The story suggests that God can and will work with our desires and ambitions. Because that's what we have. God gave us desires for more. We want more. We seek more. We hope for more. And we need more. And so those desires can be redirected. And our ambitions can be purified. What's lethal is not our striving. What's lethal is giving up. It's lethal to be apathetic or cynical or to just be complacent and say, I don't matter at all. What's lethal is not arresting those glory seekers who will extract from others anything needed to satisfy ego's insatiable thirst for power and money and prestige. So I'm making a short story long, but let's go back to the story. James and John make a demand, do for us what we want. And in turn, Jesus asks the question that he always asks, what can I do for you? Not, here's what I want, or here's what I'm expecting of you. Jesus offers, like he does all throughout this gospel, how can I serve you? After the brothers' failed attempt to secure the right and left side, Jesus then expands the circle to teach the rest of the disciples because they too have descended into bickering. And he calls them together and cautions them, don't be like the Gentiles. They all fight for hierarchies. They all fight for a superior place. 
And that is a road to destruction because those hierarchies then lead to rulers above them and those rulers turn into tyrants. And he flips the entire order upside down. Don't strive to be on the top. Look to be a servant. It's level at the foot of the cross. Then Mark's gospel includes one of the bright keys to unlocking the mystery of the cross. Jesus says, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus indicates his death does something. His death does something for them and us. It secures a release. And that little phrase has sparked lively debates throughout Christendom. And I will contend it's often misunderstood by those who only want to see the cross as a specific type of payment to satisfy the penalties of human sin or to repay something believed owed to God. You can't boil down to the cross into one thing or a few words. The explicit context in Mark's gospel of the word ransom is about power and servitude. It's not about the problem of sin or to secure forgiveness. When Jesus describes his death as a ransom, this single word points to all of the stories in the faith history in which God actively works to release and save the people. It's about being freed from bondage. It's about being brought into the promised land. It's about God actively giving us an abundant life. Jesus declares without stopping to clarify precisely how that through his death, God will free us from oppression and any captivity of being placed in someone else's hands. The only path to success is by surrendering our most cherished forms of what we think we're entitled to. Because the way of the cross is to give all of that up and to pick up the role of serving. Because serving is the goal. And through his life, death, and resurrection, we see that serving creates abundance. Serving empowers others. And to serve is to share in his glory. By all means, this story tells us we are to aspire to achieve, but not to have a glory that's based upon hoarding or multiplying our own. Glory in God's kingdom is about offering ourselves in love. Now James and John are flesh and blood examples of the ways in which we can become seduced by the values of hierarchy and claiming one-upsmanship. And James and John are flesh and blood examples that once they saw Christ's death and as predicted his resurrection, they let go of all of those rivalries, and they serve as the beautiful examples of what it means to serve. They gave their life. They gave all of their lives to ensure that we understand this gospel. Now, before we leave this master storyteller, the writer of Mark, the writer of Mark puts another story immediately after this to drive the point home. So they're on the road and they step into the town of Jericho. And that's when they find a blind beggar sitting by the road who begins to shout. And Jesus turns to that man and says, what can I do for you? And the man says, let me see. Isn't that the good news? Jesus opens this man's eyes and through all of these stories, the gospel opens our eyes to see just how twisted our lives can become when we battle for a place in hierarchies. And the good news of the gospel comes in that Jesus does free us from all of the bondage of thinking we've got to strive when in fact all we need to do is serve. Jesus gives his all as if to say, look at me so that we can see the life of service that he lives. His ultimate service is by dying, and the disciples' service thereafter is our ongoing model. 
And the greatest gift we give others and ourselves is in serving. That's where we find, that's where we create the glory. May it be so, my friends.